Welcome to this week's live stream and solo show. And actually, if you are somehow listening to this, because I did put out a blog post saying this won't be a podcast, it'll just be a live stream or a video version, mostly because we're about to be doing a walkthrough of some tarot cards, and that would get quite boring <laughs> if you were just trying to listen to it. But if you are listening to this as a podcast, what it means is the discussion of the fall of Numenor was of such high quality, really unmissable, you know, really unmissable insight that that plus the Q&A at the end are uh, uh, worth a podcast. So however you are consuming this, welcome aboard. Uh, I am in Taupo, I'm beside Lake Taupo in the central North Island of New Zealand. It's not quite where I was meant to be <laughs> just yet, but I'm in a, in a hotel room beside the lake. Now, this is quite a loud place. It's funny when you do things like live, live stream or record videos in general, you pay extra attention to the soundscape. So if you hear the dulcet shrieks of children outside, that's because they're playing ping pong pretty much just outside my window. Love that for me and for you. And also, it's just New Zealand, so it's a adventure travel place, which means you will hear uh, speedboats for the parasailing, you will hear little planes for the skydiving, and you will hear helicopters for the heli tours. Uh, I tried to get my drone up yesterday and the app wouldn't let me uh, take off <laughs> because restricted, and I get it, of course, restricted airspace in every direction because of the amount of, uh, of infernal flying machines that are already here above the lake. Uh, but you know, that's how it is. That's how adventures go. Uh, I'm here on account of, well, I'm here for a wedding this weekend, but I'm specifically here right now rather than the East Coast on account of a cyclone and not so much an earthquake, although that did also happen <laughs> as well. I'm just going to jump into the chat and say hello. Um, audio is fortunately quite nice so far. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've got a mic on. That will be good. Nice. Uh, Gordon has now thrown me with the Spanish. Yeah, hey, as far as you know, I speak fluent Spanish. I do not. <laughs> All right, so we're going to jump into a discussion of a book. Let me bring up, let me bring in and up the HarperCollins page for a book that I bought here in New Zealand when I was here in November. I'm getting here every three months at the moment for um, health and healing reasons. And also this trip, there was a wedding and research for the final book in the Dot Trilogy. But this is The Fall of Numenor by Brian Sibley, which if you buy direct from the publisher is apparently on sale at the moment. It was described, I was looking at some reviews before jumping on the live stream, as redundant but beautiful. And a couple of things there. Firstly, there is no beauty that is redundant. Uh, I, from an aesthetic perspective, that's not correct, right? Metaphysics speaking. You cannot call something beautiful but redundant. It's beautiful. That being said, I absolutely understand why they called it that, why they use those words. Because the fall of Numenor is the story of, well, there's nothing new in it. Obviously, Tolkien's been dead for decades. But I think everyone who purchased the book, myself included, knew the story. This is Tolkien's Atlantis with a little bit of Byzantium. And I, we'll, we'll come on to that in a minute. But what it did, which was so good, was pull all that material together, mostly from Christopher Tolkien's work in the history of Middle Earth, but also there's some parts of it in different letters that Tolkien had written and so on, and kind of brought it together chronologically so that you essentially have a story of the most important things that happen in the Second Age. And there is something about and in addition to the beautiful, before I get to that, it's also peppered with Alan Lee uh, original, mostly sketches, which are lovely. And combined with having a hardcover book and the smell, I didn't bring it with me because I'd already shipped it across the Tasman once. And I didn't want to, I can't be carrying hardcover books with me wherever I go. I'm already at a luggage premium as it is because I'm here for work. I'm here for a wedding. The amount of I wish I could just travel for one reason for once. Uh, I know that's, that sounds like a boo fucking who <laughs> situation, but if I get my bag searched, I look like a lunatic. It's like, what's that? That's my shamanic mesa. What's that? That's clothing for a wedding. What's that? Scuba gear. I, anyway, hey, 
<laughs> that's what it looks like. So I didn't bring the book with me, but I have read it and I love it. And in fact, I wanted to get it done just before I came back. Now I bought it in New Zealand in November, the day it came out. And it was, speaking of the cyclone, unseasonably wet, record-breaking wet November uh, when I was here, well, there in Auckland. Auckland's a few hundred kilometers north of where I am. And it just sort of struck me, obviously, New Zealand, Middle Earth, uh, and the place was effectively sinking in the sense that it was flooding. And it just, it seemed archetypally resonant, which will come up again in the Q&As when we get to it. And I'm like, okay, cool. There's this, I like stepping into that archetypal sequence and, and seeing where the medicine is. And then I finished the book. And what's so powerful about it this arrangement by Brian Sibley of information that we already know is the growing horror, the growing creeping horror. If you don't know the story of Numenor, I can tell you in a couple of minutes. I even, uh, even ChatGPT knows it because on a whim just before we went live, I'm like, I wonder if, I wonder how wrong ChatGPT will get uh, the history of Numenor in a thousand words, which was the prompt I gave it, because it can't, it, it actually gets a lot of Tolkien wrong, um, stuff that nerds know about and care, but it tried to say that Elrond was in possession of Nenya, which is Galadriel's ring, and you know, just blasphemies like that. But it got it right. Um, and so I'm going to scroll down to where that happens. Numenor is also known as Westerness. And it was an island given to the Idain uh, by the Valar. So the Valar are physically embodied powers, or you could say archangels in the legendarium. They were physically embodied at the time. And the Idain are essentially the humans who live for centuries, who in an alliance, essentially the first alliance rather than the last uh, with elves, defeated Morgoth with the assistance of the Valar. So as a reward, they get this beautiful, Atlantean island off the coast at the time of Middle Earth. And, uh, and the book goes into tremendous detail in that terrifying way of Tolkien about the biology and the, the sort of animals that are there and how they didn't really have pets because the wild animals were tame. The, the women of Numenor would feed the birds and squirrels so that they would just be around <laughs> their houses. And the kind of fish and the fact that they never saw any sharks and all the rest of it, just really detailed stuff. And, and you go through the first few centuries of this being a Atlantean paradise where the elves would visit. They weren't allowed to travel further west, uh, which is the direction of the Undying Lands, then they couldn't leave eyesight of Numenor. That's as far west as they could go. Uh, and you could sort of on some nights see Tol Erisea, which is the, let's say, the outer lying islands of the Undying Lands. That's where the elves lived, some of them. So that was there's a few centuries of this kind of paradise of hanging out with the elves, living for 500 years, because they humans die in, it's called the, the gift of men. Uh, humans actually die and leave Arda, which is Middle Earth, as opposed to the elves who don't. Uh, and But they, they had long life, 500 years. So you, you go through centuries of this marvelous civilization, but there is something about the story that is terrifyingly resonant for now. Now, remember I said it's it's Tolkien's Atlantis because obviously it's an island of very wise people that sink uh, and whose survivors populate the kingly lineage uh, on Middle Earth, the few survivors. So it's got that Atlantis story in it. Uh, most of the wisdom is lost, but there's a little bit that's left. And uh, this, I remember how I said it's also his Byzantium, because it is also a kind of fall of that, um, for, of a historically, mythically perfect kingdom. Not that I'm saying Byzantium is, but you understand what I mean. And it's interesting because I was talking to Austin Kopic in advance of, I think it was about two solo shows ago, or two uh, astro shows ago. He said, we're in a Byzantine moment. So understanding the breakup of Western hegemony, which we're undergoing right now, one of the ways to think about it is in a Byzantine situation where there's uh, factions and the breakup of it due to essentially the inertia of things like corruption and, and so on. 
So, and I'm like, yeah, 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 that's cool. I get it. Uh, and apparently, I can't remember exactly. That's why I have him on the show. There are some specific astrological configurations that map to a Byzantine moment, uh, like a fall of Rome early uh, Byzantium moment. And now you'll have to ask him. Maybe I will on the next solo show. <laughs> so I think, having looked at this, that Numenor is in fact a an extra version of what it is I believe he was talking about there. Because coming back to that creeping horror, uh, which is more obvious in, in the sequence of the book, because it begins, everything's great. And then it, it starts to get a little bit bad. You know, they start thinking, how can I extend my life even longer than 500 years? So they start thinking about moving outside of the natural cosmic, let's say, function of a human, of a man, because mm, Tolkien, for, we, I'm just going to keep saying human. And that's where it begins. It's like, well, how as a king can I extend my time on earth? And that grew into more of an interest in tombs than beginnings. So across the island, great kingly tombs started to spring up because this idea of extending life as possible and what happens after, where we go once we leave Arda and so on, meant that it started to look towards death. That was the beginning of it. Uh, as Numenor, because it was banned from traveling west, it would travel east, and it initially would visit Middle Earth and teach the humans that were there visit their elvish friends and teach the humans that were there more of that civilizational stuff than they had because the race of men on Middle Earth had declined. And that grew over the centuries into an imperial project where they would have permanent fortifications along the coast uh, and so on. Then there was another the war between the elves and Sauron. This is all second age stuff and I'll come to why that's uh, important in a moment. And what essentially happens at this point when they are militaristic and imperialistic and arrogant consequently they'd extended their life as far as they could possibly and you know were, were sailing east and there was even talk of sailing further west like why are we not doing this so the rot had already set in when as part of assisting the elves in the defeat of sauron sauron essentially surrenders and it's a trick so he surrenders to the king of numenor and is taken back to numenor as a prisoner and it's from there that he, and this is when he can still take physical form, but also beautiful physical form. And he sort of ingratiates himself into the court and gets the ear of the king. And this is when you start to see a real split in the island. And Tolkien calls the differences between them, the king's men and the faithful. And the king's men listen to Sauron and they're already trying to understand why it is they have to die. And Sauron twists that because obviously as a servant of Morgoth, he is in open rebellion against the Valar and wishes to rule Middle-earth. And he tells them, well, the, the Valar are keeping immortality from you. And what you should do is invade the Undying Lands because if you live there, you will not die. So it's this trick where he was saying it's the land that the Valar live on that lets them live forever. And so this includes that the, they are, this grows and grows and grows. And the faithful are the ones who are like, this is some bullshit. And faithful in the sense that they are faithful to their friendship with the elves. And to an awareness of the valor. Rather than a worship, because that's not how, which I like, that's not how it rolls in Middle Earth. Now, crucially, the faithful, so let's just say the good guys, were always loyal to the king. It's just they wanted no part of this technocratic immortality project, this vain immortality project. And Sauron takes it a bit further too. He starts sacrificing initially their uh, slaves and, and humans that they bring back from Middle-earth to Morgoth, who is trapped in the outer darkness because part of his trick is like, well, we bring Morgoth back if you um, basically worship the dark and you can live forever. So Sauron institutes a, a sacrificial regime which then ends up including children and all the rest of it. So again, we have the sacrifice of the young for the old. And when you look at the split between the king's men and the faithful, 
Uh, first of all, I'm struck by the resonance that the, and I mentioned this in the blog post, the book, which is the story of the most important stuff that happens in the second age, with the exception of the creation of the rings, is it comes out the same year as the disastrous Amazon project, the rings of power. So that itself is a split between the Kingsmen, which is the Amazon approach, which thinks it knows better uh, and makes Sauron the good guy and Galadriel the bad guy, the terrible Galadriel, Galadiel, the bad guy. So you have a Sauronic inversion contained within it. And here we have this book that is the faithful. And what's fascinating is Brian Sibley, I'm not, I have no idea what he thinks of the Rings of Power show. I can but speculate. <clears throat> it's not like he wrote that book as a reaction either. When you embark on a project, a publishing project like this, particularly if you're publishing through HarperCollins, which would take a couple of years, the book would have been conceived of and probably complete, uh, completed before the first, certainly before the first episode of Rings of Power aired. So it's not like it was a response in an intentional sense. It's just what emerged from the new sphere in 2022 at the time. You actually have a faithful and a Kingsman <clears throat> version or map of Middle Earth, which itself is a map of what's going on right now. So there's a couple of things, the trajectory and pace of the growing horror as Numenor makes all these mistakes that essentially it doesn't need to make. And they only increased until they get to the point of open darkness, blatantly sacrificing children to Satan uh, in, in a Middle Earth context and seeking to live forever, particularly the elders seeking to live forever. And so it starts off with a few little errors and grows. And the book just has that as this pacing, which again, it's not, this is Brian Sibley's skill, I think, because it's not necessarily there in Tolkien because all the, the stuff's all over the place in the history of Middle Earth, been in the Silmarillion, been in the letters and so on. But somehow that the story of the growing horror is there. And that I think is the other reason why it is such a, a teachable story arc or myth theme for now. Because that's certainly, depending on when you want to kind of like put a pin in the timeline and you could put it anywhere, <laughs> anywhere in the post-war era, really, wherever you want to put the, the pin, or let's even say from the beginning of technocracy, which is pre-World pre War I, frankly, wherever you want to put that pin as like, well, that's a dumb idea. Mm, that's not quite in resonance with a living cosmos and just have it grow in horror. Or you can do a simpler one and sort of put the pin in from three years ago, let's say, and just watch as this king's men demented ideology grows in horror and violence to where we are now, uh, as opposed to the faithful. And why this is medicinal or why this is teachable at the moment is the, which I'm not the first person to say this, that's for sure. The left-right divide is, has less and less utility, uh, intellectual utility, certainly over the last three years. It's almost like categorizing cars as horseless or horse-drawn carriages. It's not a relevant distinction anymore. Uh, certainly not given the, and this is a real Kingsman thing, right? The left's, the uh, public or the loud online left uh, as a mass abandonment of anti-war positions, uh, right to free assembly, bodily integrity. Those were the, the triumvirate. That's an anarchist triumvirate right there. <laughs> and uh, they're all gone. And not just gone, but like replaced by naked warmongering and submission to the requirements of the world's largest criminal organizations. Uh, and that, you, the growing horror looks like King's Men versus the Faithful. And why that split is quite good is that the Faithful, again, they remain in resonance with what humans are kind of like supposed to be in Middle Earth, but they also say like, King, we are loyal, but we want no part of this nonsense. And they kind of hung out on the Western part of the island where you could still see Tol Erisea. And there is something about that that's resonant with 
so it's like this. The, uh, the left has gone in a Kingsman direction. The solve then isn't like, well, fuck it, let's go far right, for fuck's sake. It's, it's not that. It's I am going to maintain loyalty to positions that are anti-war, right to free assembly, bodily integrity, and so on. Like I officially say that while also saying, you fuckers have lost your mind. So that's the, the frame that, as I'm just reading through the book going like, wow, <laughs> I can't, I don't think Brian Sibley realized it would have been, it was such a resonant and medicinal magic bomb, a little file of Galadriel uh, for 2022 when he set out to write the book, right? But also, who knew? I would Tolkien have known that of all the stuff in Middle Earth, the story of Numenor has a higher predictive, I don't know, capacity uh, or higher predictive resonance than Nostradamus. It's, and, and that's where I think its medicine lies because it is a story of a thing that always happens. Like it comes back to that, that cycle idea, that, that notion of cycles. So as the, as the book progresses towards its end, and the horror is so great. And eventually, of course, uh, at Sauron doesn't go with, he stays uh, on Numenor sacrificing people. <laughs> but the king assembles the mightiest uh, naval fleet that has ever existed in Middle Earth and sets sail, breaks the ban of the Valar, sets sail from the west to invade the Undying Lands. And they get there, and a couple of them, including the king, get off and sort of stand on the Undying Lands. No one's sort of there to meet them. And he just sort of declares, all right, cool, I'm the king of the Undying Lands now. And then he gets landslid as part of a process where in the middle of the ocean, um, the Valar and Eru Iluvita, God, intervenes at that moment to remake Middle Earth, which is to say, sink the island of Numenor. Uh, and, and consequently that whole process floods a whole bunch of lands in Middle Earth and it takes the undying lands where the Valar are and Tol Erisea and essentially moves them out of this dimension so that there is no longer a physical embodiment of the sacred as a result of this sin, of this error that is available at the level of physical sensing. So any time after that, when the elves want to leave Middle Earth, they take the boat to the west, but they essentially dimension shift to get to the Undying Lands and Tol Erisea. And that again has, I think, a predictive quality as we head into World War III, uh, but also where the horror of that is, and, the, and, the, and Tolkien goes into detail describing it, as the island sinks, because that's where all the women and the children are and all the libraries. And it's not just the king's men, it's the faithful. Everyone gets sunk. It's not, uh, it's not human justice. It's not, okay, well, the king's, because this is God, right? He could explode the heads of all of the king's men and keep the faithful alive and go, cool, well, we've expunged this. But that's not what happens because that isn't how God works, I suppose. And it is how humans live with consequences, which is the innocent die along with the guilty to the extent that you have to ask yourself, how useful is that categorization? If you are part of the faithful and you want, it's all good to say, I don't want any part of this Kingsmen project. Sauron is still sacrificing people on your island. What do you do about that? If you do nothing, you're running the risk that your island will sink. And so the fall of Numenor is, and by the way, this is why I mentioned at the beginning, even ChatGPT knows the story, is I do recommend reading it because even though it's a, essentially a horror story in many respects, there's deep medicine in it for now. Uh, and I don't, I can't spoil it for you. It's, it's Atlantis, which you know, uh, and it's the fall of Numenor, which chat GPT knows. It's, it's the, an island of uh, intelligent men, as in race of men, who makes a series of uh, expanding wrong decisions uh, leading to the destruction of that civilization. What does that sound like to you? <laughs> 
Uh, and again, I wasn't going to, I thought about bringing the book and I'm like, you know, I'll do this live stream or I'll do a video or a solo show about the fall of Numenor when I get back to Tasmania, where I can actually hold the book up. But I got here and there was a cyclone and an earthquake and uh, it seemed like there is a physical uh, resonance. Oh, and also I, if you were, if you're on the answer, <laughs> God, I did some really nerdly stuff in Wellington. Uh, I went to the Weta workshop and I drove past Sir Peter Jackson's house on the way here <laughs> in the pouring rain, like at the edge of a cyclone, which was out of my way, but I'm like, no, I'm driving up the central North Island. Fuck it, I'm gonna drive by his house. Uh, and so I did. And so doing some like weird and nerdly stuff. And I'm like, yeah, this is where, this is where I need to or want to be telling that story. So that's the, oh, and the other thing that's sort of worth thinking about or thinking with is that Sauron is on the island when it sinks and he loses his physical form at that point. That's when he loses it and sort of returns to Middle Earth as a spirit. Uh, and doesn't really take physical form, although this isn't quite correct. Like this is how it is in the films. He does in fact have a physical form in the books because Gollum is able to physically describe him, but he loses it at that point. And it's this idea that the destruction of Numenor isn't quite punishment and it isn't quite a purging or a cleansing because Sauron survives. And it's there's the haunting horror. <laughs> <laughs> of even the mistakes that we're doing now, uh, evil can survive them, you know? And it's a question of coming back to where you intervene or what you think about from a medicinal perspective because of it. So yeah, the king's men's position is essentially technocracy, as I understand it. It's an artificial means of extending life forever, regardless of the cost. Uh, it is human-centric at the expense of the whole of Arda, which was what the faithful and the elves were like, what are you, what are you doing? You're, you will break the cosmos by trying to stay here longer. And here we are moving into a pseudo green revolution, which is to say a technocratic uh, attempt to co-opt useful energy and replace it with scam energy to the point that Bill Gates says, we will have to mine every single ounce of all these rare earth minerals in order to make the batteries that he thinks are required to run his technocratic dystopia, right? So it's that same, like you are breaking all of the cosmos for this technocratic perfection. Uh, and it's also accidentally blasphemous, blasphemous rather than deliberately, at least until Sauron starts sacrificing uh, humans to Morgoth because it is in gross, naked violation of right relation. And that's something I think about in an Andean context where good and evil isn't quite right uh, in an Andean context. What instead happens is the same thing that happens to your body when it has toxins in it. It will remove them. And that, that's fever, that's diarrhea, that's, you know, an expulsion, an expulsion of toxins. The cosmos does the same thing with anything that's out of right relation, and it's a non-judgmental removal. And I, I wonder if there's a way of thinking about the Vala, Vomanwe, and Iluvatar's response to the invasion of the Undying Lands as that, rather than an, uh, an intervention at the level of anger or justice, if it is the divine logic of removal of, I'm just gonna remove the stuff that is not in right relation. And again, where is, how do we sit with that? How, assuming that if you're listening to this, you fall under my metaphoric categorization of the faithful. How do we sit with that? Uh, there's, there's medicine in it. it. It's not a question that should be answered. You sit with it like this. <laughs> there's medicine in it. There's medicine in the sitting with, in the asking. Uh, and yeah, so that's what I wanted to say about the fall of Numenor. Uh, to pick it up, to sort of weave in <laughs> fleeing a cyclone. Uh, and it was interesting because I had to kind of duck the worst of the weather. The north of the North Island got hit 
well, in theory, it got hit the worst, but actually the East Coast ended up getting, in when all is said and done, the worst of the damage. And I was in the bottom of the South Island when it started happening. But because of the way cyclones move, which is succular, uh, <laughs> I had to kind of leave, had to stay in Wellington for a certain amount of time and then head up the North Island into the cyclone as the weather was coming in underneath it. And that went reasonably well. But I, for whatever reason, I was planning a couple of places. I was supposed to be on the East Coast visiting Montefero, uh, completely cut off. As far as I can tell, they're fine, although I haven't spoken to them in a couple of days because I don't think the power and connections are fully restored yet. And there's a town, this is sort of near where Sir Peter Jackson lives actually, in the, the about two hours north of Wellington called Masterton, which I'd never been to before. And I was just really compelled, like I want to, uh, I could have either stayed in Wellington and rode it out in a nicer hotel, but I wanted to get further up the island just in case the weather stuck around and I couldn't make it here for tomorrow's wedding because as previously mentioned, I'm the MC and I'm kind of obliged to be here consequently. So I said, I'll go to Masterton, but I couldn't understand why I was picking Masterton. It was just this profound, deep stirring compulsion to pick this one little town. Could have picked somewhere further north and you guys, most of you don't know these places, but further north and differently grim, like Palmerston North, just to get me a little bit closer. And I, I just, you know what? That morning I woke up and I booked a frankly unlovely uh, road motel in Masterton. And I thought, there'll be something there. There is a bookstore that's been around for more than 100 years in Masterton called Headley's, which as of now, I think has a reputation it does not deserve. I thought that was going to be it. I'm like, I must, there must be a book at this bookstore that is calling me. So I went uh, and I stayed overnight at Masterton and uh, in the pouring rain and the 100 kilometer an hour winds, I went and found this bookstore, which was shit. Uh, it doesn't deserve that reputation. Uh, well, I mean, I hope, I hope all bookstores last, but I, I couldn't, it, it was just top five publisher stuff not very well curated and frankly not a lot of stock in what was a, a very large building so uh, i hope they stick around they're really friendly that is what it is so i as you do as i'm sure everyone watching or listening to this does i went to the mind body spirit slash philosophy section to see what they had and they had one sitting there kind of skew with atop a stack of books of this tarot card deck, the Lord of the Rings tarot card deck. Now I, as you may have deciphered from the meandering conversation about the fall of Numenor we just had, I'm a bit of a Lord of the Rings nerd, a bit of a Middle Earth nerd. And I didn't know this existed. <laughs> and not just that, I actually really vibe on the artwork. So I bought it and not just I bought it, I thought, is this what I came to Masterton for? And not just that, um, when something like this, I wasn't even supposed to be in Masterton. I was supposed to be on the East Coast. And so, and plainly I'm not, this is not how uh, inner interpretation works. Plainly I'm not saying that the cyclone was about me getting a deck of tarot cards. What I am saying is I would not have known these existed nor owned them had that sequence of events that involved me not making it to Fatu Araki. And, and oh, by the way, the day I left Wellington, there was an earthquake. So again, sort of ducking in and around calamities. I show up and I get these cards. It does not mean that this deck of cards, this deck of tarot cards, the Lord of the Rings tarot, is super powerful. Okay, this is, uh, if you've done the, or if you're doing the foundations course, we talk about how magical objects are required to have story to come to you. This certainly does have that, but it doesn't mean this is like some sort of all powerful tarot deck, right? What it does, I suspect mean, when stuff like that happens, because it was just really, you know how it is when you find objects like this in, in bookstores in particular, 
When I took it to the counter, the guy didn't even know they had it. There was one of them off and it was basically facing him because obviously the mind, body, spirit section, as you know, is the one that is very often stolen from the most, which is weird when you think about it. But it was in the eyeline of the guy who worked at the front counter and he had never seen it before. His last name is Headley, so I think he was one of the owners. No, he was working for the owner. That's not right. But he's like, oh, I didn't even know we had this or that it existed. And it was just one of those oddly dropped objects that compels you to pick up, which I did. <clears throat> so what I think this will, what I think will end up happening with these cards is that I will have a reading with them that will be life transformative and it will have a message that could only have been told with these cards. That's the power of it. When you find an object like this, it doesn't mean, haha. Like, because really what happened was I went into a bookstore because of the rain and found a Lord of the Rings thing, which of course I would buy because I hoard that stuff. That's the prosaic example. The other one is I would not have found that. And it constellated, it was, it was sort of not glowing. You know what it's like when you encounter an object like that. It's like, wow, this is mine. <laughs> this is something I am supposed to have. It, it helps. I would have bought it if it was ugly. But it's not. I actually really vibe on Casey Gillies' artwork. So I picked it up and I took it back to the room and here we are. So I should like to do a Lord of the Rings tarot unboxing and talk you through the good and the bad because it's pretty. They're pretty cuts. First thing, that's the box. Obviously I've showed that enough times. Here's the thing I like the least. When I open it up, okay, little white book looking all right. Oh, oh no. Oh, what are you doing to me? What kind of 1970s travel map nightmare is this shit? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I don't know if they're going with some kind of reference to the contract that Bilbo signed in the Hobbit films, which is to say, this is quite literally the most annoying little white book I have ever encountered. Uh, so that's a miss. <laughs> that just seems unnecessarily gimmicky as far as I'm concerned. Uh, especially as for the first few readings, you are going to want this. And I'll explain that when we get to some of the court cards. There are some non-obvious choices, some obvious ones in the arcana, which we'll, we'll do uh, and will make sense. But there's some non-obvious choices in the court cards, which means I will have to refer to this once or twice. This, map bold choice all right the rest of the box is kind of cute i like having the the reason i'm noticing this stuff is our fortunes fools deck is in production and we literally just had a discussion about what image we have underneath the cards in our box so i notice all these things in a way <laughs> that i otherwise wouldn't but yeah that's the that's the map i'm just going to leave it open and annoying there because i Suspect I will have to refer to it imminently. Surprising no one, the full card is Frodo. Uh, I did have to check in case it was Bilbo. It is the Lord of the Rings rather than Middle Earth. And so it is in fact Frodo, the magician. I mean, come on now, this stuff. Because the Lord of the Rings is archetypal and so is tarot, it, it's almost chicken and the egg, you know, is that's not the right way of saying it. The magician card is already Gandalf, and Gandalf is already the magician card because they draw from that same European archetypal well. Similarly, who else but Galadriel? Let me just make sure that's in here. Yeah. And as I said, I'm vibing on the art. I'm vibing on, on how this works. Uh, Arwen, and again, there is, I don't know if it was Casey's doing, I assume it is, she definitely has sufficient knowledge of, there are a few cards, it'll make sense in a minute, there are a few cards which shows that she's not just a movie fan who also happens to be an artist, you know what I mean? Equally, and that's a reasonable description or a reasonable look at Aragorn, Aragorn as emperor. Once again, this right kingship idea, just like Gandalf and the magician, Aragorn and the Empress, or the Emperor card emerge from the same, that is the same being. Do you understand what I mean? So all of it tracks. Elrond is Hierophant, good choice. 
Um, very good choice. Yeah, like I said, vibing on the the lovers. I mean, again, who who else but who else but Arwen and Aragorn? They Aragorn in particular recurs a number of times. The chariot, interesting. Samwise, that one. You could kind of find a way in. So the chariot is, that's right, it's cancer in the the stuff that I don't usually use, like the, the traditional, which is to say 19th, early 20th century astrological associations. So cancer is home. You could kind of get Samwise out of that. He's pushing a wheelbarrow. Uh, it'll work. Uh, it is also, it's a subtle victory because obviously the chariot is forward momentum and victory. And he, he Sam, is that movement, particularly at the end, which you would know from the movies as well, of him carrying Frodo into the crack of doom. Uh, a, a frankly very scary looking Gimli, but in a good way, if you, like me, played Warhammer or play uh, Warhammer, you'll note that one of the few imperfections, I would say, in the Lord of the Rings films and I know he did some effort around it, is the dwarves never feel fully fleshed out. You, you don't really get that in Lord of the Rings. It's not necessarily Sir Peter Jackson's fault. You get more of the dwarves if you read the Silmarillion and so on. But there's a, you, I see a personality and a potency in Gimli that is often missing. The hermit, here we get Bilbo writing his book. And again, good idea, particularly as he secrets himself away at the beginning of the book slash movie in Rivendell. So it all tracks. Wheel of Fortune, I mean, I don't know what else you would pick for that. You could do War Machines, it's not as good. I don't know, you could have put some Helm's Deep wall breaking in there. It's a water wheel. Um, Justice, again, real pretty. Legolas, obviously. The Hanged Man, who else is it going to be? Once again, we're at that point, and I, this is actually quite lovely. Let me just bring that closer. Um, who else is it going to be? Uh, and I like the subtle. So the Hanged Man contains a story that's bigger than Gollum's story, but Gollum's story is a Hanged Man story. Uh, and, and because it is, certainly as it's expressed in the films, there is that addiction compulsion component to it. So it's a good choice. Again, who else was I going to be? <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, um, Mount Doom for death. Good choice. It's going to be somewhere. Temperance, Mr. Galadriel, Celeborn. And that, that works for Lord of the Rings, maybe, but Celeborn isn't that temperate. Um, he still hates dwarves, and all, if you knew, his Silmarillion story doesn't speak to temperance, but I guess you can't put Galadriel on every card. I would have galadriel that, to be honest. The Devil, Witch King of Angmar, that's a really nice one. I like that. And I like that it's... Uh, it's film adjacent. There are... One of the things, and I'm sure you, if you're a Lord of the Rings nerd, you'll understand this. When it comes to post-film creative expression, and you can find this on DeviantArt, you can find this wherever, it's either deliberately trying to not be anything to do with it and uh, kind of gets a bit too 70s, uh, 70s, fantasy, science fiction, pulp cover doesn't work that well. Or it um, it emerges from someone who's really only seen the films and is doing sketches or inspiration based on actors playing a particular role. This one threads a needle that I quite like, which is, which we'll notice when we get to the minor arcana, uh, inspired by the film and this film adjacent. The star, Uh, the moon, okay, mirror of Galadriel, real nice. Again, excellent choice. And once more, because <laughs> we're dealing with the same archetypal well, because that's reflective, but it's also, as even she says in the film, it's not 
100% predictive. There is an unreliability to the mirror in the same way they, there is to the signification of the moon in the tarot. Uh, the sun, this is a really good choice, actually. So I'm going to go with Eowyn at the, well, maybe not the end of the film, because that looks quite Edorassian rather than Athelian. -in 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 -in. So I would say that's Eowyn basically before the heroes show up. But I like that that golden hearth home capacity is a good choice for the sun. Judgment, I think, is one of my favorites. So um, Horn of Gondor, Boromir's Horn, I think it's an excellent choice. Obviously, because the Marseille Judgment card is an angel using <laughs> trumpets to blast naked corpses out of the ground. I fucking love the Marseille. Uh, but also, given... Uh, Boromir uses this in conjunction with his own, let's say, right judgment after an error. I think that card is an improvement almost on the original signification of judgment. And then the world is the fellowship itself, which I think is a really cute idea, which reminds me of the New Orleans Voodoo Tower where um, the world, or is it the Wheel of Fortune, is the marketplace. And it's that same idea, but um, here's that kind of, I love that idea of the, them being complete. All right, I should mention, actually, no, you guys know that. Hold the Q&A to the end, because I'm here talking to the camera. So the, uh, I get why, and this is, for people who are unaware, I am a big fan in, even though I just said I love the Marseille, which is the one I typically use for, let's say, proper readings, although I will use these. I like theme decks. I know it's unfashionable, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons I like them. One of the things I don't like about theme decks is when they change the suits. Uh, I don't even like saying ones, I say batons, right? Uh, and however, when you're doing a Lord of the Rings deck, you are inevitably going to change, let's say, the Earth suit, um, pentacles, whatever, to rings. Of course you are. And so the Ace of Rings is the ring. It's interesting, though. It subtly shifts the, the energy of it and almost makes it anti-wealth <laughs> or anti-capitalist because the King of Rings is Saruman. So again, it's sort of uh, King of Earth isn't, uh, I guess you could. He does have an army and all the rest of it. So it's, it's not too far off. But here's where, here's where it shifts, right? So this is Rosie Cotton as the Queen of Rings. Again, a really good classic tarot choice because let's say Queen of Pentacles, Queen of Earth suit, because you know I don't like the word pentacle, has a Rosie Cotton uh, energy in its own. Like she's probably not queenly enough, but you do need, there's not that many women, as you know, in Lord of the Rings, and certainly not, because Goldberry, for instance, would be wrong um, for that. Because first of all, she's a water spirit <laughs> rather than an earth. But that's not hearth and home. It's weirder than that, you know? Knight of Rings, I forget. I'm just going to have to consult the map while I show you this card. Um, Ace of Cups, Wands, Rings. See what I mean? Come on now. So it's Faramir. Okay, good choice. Faramir is the Knight of Rings. Page of Rings, my favorite. Quickbeam. Who includes Quickbeam in anything to do with Lord of the Rings? But that's Speedy and Earth. It's clever. That's a really good move, right? Now the rest, uh, again, sort of Marseille inspired in the sense that the pip cards Remember, I think it was in the last Q&A where I railed against people who don't like Marseille because they don't have no Pikachus uh, on, the, my, on the pips, which is dumb, right? First of all, these are pictures. Second of all, how do you understand radio? <laughs> uh, and so that's cool. The rings are, this is what I mean by inspired by the films, but not quite uh, filmic. Ace of Swords was always going to be the sword that was broken, right? 
Uh, who have we got for King of Swords? I think it's Glorfindel, which again, good, good choice. Uh, understandably excised from the film, but King of Swords, Glorfindel. Again, if you're I mean, if you're watching this, you and are still watching this, you're going to be some kind of nerd, uh, Lord of the Rings nerd. And we got Aowen again for Queen of Swords. Again, who else are you going to pick? In a good sense, that was a good choice. Knight of Swords, come on now. I this one. Come on now. Boromir, okay. So that one's definitely not Sean Bean. That's why this is going to be one of the ones that I'm going to have to consult the map <laughs> uh, should Boromir come up. Because when you use a theme deck that maps to something that has archetypal depth, which Lord of the Rings does, there is the typical Knight of Swords signification, which is the majority of the medicine, except for when it isn't, except for when it's in fact the story of Boromir that the cards are showing you in a reading in response to a question instead. Pippin, again, for the Page of Swords, archetypally perfect. Uh, again, because it comes from that same archetypal well. There is, I think, there's a, a little bit of Pikachus on these, right? Uh, I think it's this one somewhere in here. Yes. Yeah, so the it's typically swords in a really Marseille sense in the suit of swords, but the eight, Shelob, which I think is a cute idea. All right. Ace of Cups, Treebeard, so that the, the water that the hobbits drink that makes them tall. King of Cups, Gandalf the White, Odd choice. Um, I could make that work. I don't know who else you'd pick. Uh, yeah, I think that's part of it. I don't know who else you'd pick. <laughs> Queen of Cups, Galadriel, inevitable choice, and you know, a good one. This also means that you have there is a possibility that you could do a reading that's like all Eowyn and all Galadriel. You do a four card reading, it's like, wow. It's, it's two ladies four times, ring a ding. Okay, Knight of Cups. Come on. This, you understand why I opened with, this is not good. Uh, Knight of Cups is Aragorn. I guess that would be in Strider mode. Not sure, uh, you know, he had to have been some kind of Knight of Cups charming to uh, Wu Arwen. So yeah, yeah, I can make that work. Now here's where it gets weird. Uh, so this is the one that I'm going to have to keep. Just got to make sure this is right. This is Bulwara Took. So not in the films. This is one that's kind of like way out of there. So she knows what she's talking about. But the Page of Cups is Bulwara Took, which was up until Merry and Pippin came back having drunk um, the water in Fangorn, the tallest uh, of the hobbits, and obviously is a famous warrior in the history of the hobbits, but so unusual choice. Uh, Four of Cups is cute because it's, you know, ale. That's the Cups cards. Ace of Wands, cute. Again, really good. What I like about the Wands is, first of all, they're staffs because, you know, <laughs> Of course they are, which again is like a longer, it's somewhere in between baton and wands. I don't like using wands. I certainly don't like uh, using them for the signification of fire because that's wrong and that's new and recent as you, you guys know, if you've done the tarot course. Wood is phenomenologically air because trees grow in it uh, and so on. But look at this, my favorite, I think, excellent choice for Ace of Wands or batons. This is what I, the point I was trying to make is that even though one's sense weight and the golden dawn was moved around to be fire because they thought they were really clever with their swords, they're so clever and discerning that this, the sword, which literally requires fire to be made, is air. And, <laughs> and the wooden suit is fire. Anyway, uh, this one has, even though it uses the word ones, that um, foresty, airy, 
uh, original signification almost accidentally. King of Wands, again. Treebeard, who else is it going to be? Uh, Queen of Wands, I'm going to go with Arwen again. I have, I'll have to, I'd look that up on the map. This is what I wanted to get. This is a bold choice, but at least he's in it. Tom Bombadil is the Knight of Wands. Now, knights are very, like, movie around -y, and he does the opposite. I think I would have swapped tree... This guy is so nerdy, but I, I, did, I did tell you this is what this is going to be. I would have swapped Treebeard and Tom Bombadil around. Tom Bombadil being king of the old forest, and Treebeard being... He goes to war, you know? So that's more of a forward movement knight component of it. And... Uh, he had to be in here somewhere. Mary, good choice. Page of Wands. Mary in his um, Edoras drag. Uh, and I showed you all the ones. But yeah, that is the... <laughs> that's the Lord of the Rings tarot deck, I did promise. And it, it's the right palette cleanser, I think, in between Lord of the Rings, Fall of Numenor, and when we move into the Q&A. Yeah, but where would you put Tom Bombadil otherwise? It's like his extra card. So I told you, Paul, in the chat, um, Where's Radagast? Good question. There is no Radagast. You probably could have put him... No, because I think Treebeard is a better choice for King of Wands. And I mean, Tom Bombadil is a better choice for King of Wands. And Treebeard, unless you wanted to do an Antwife for the, like, because Arwen, I get it because Rivendell, like in the woods, and she did walk through the woods and lay down to essentially die. That's what that card is with her looking at the ships leaving. She, at the end of essentially her son's life, after Aragorn dies, she wanders back up to Lothlorien and sort of dies on a hill there. So I get the Queen of Woods situation, but I agree. Radagast could have been in there somewhere, but I would, I would prefer... I prefer having Tom Bombadil and Treebeard in there. And I'm actually a bit of a Radagast stan, even in the films. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Tessa said Hermit for Radagast. Good choice, actually. Then where would you put Bilbo? Uh, is there another major arcana which he would belong in? I think Bilbo is sort of bigger uh, and consequently needs to belong. It's a good choice, though. Uh, I'm not sure where else Radagast would go. Um, Ra Radagast would make a good Herbert, but then you, you're stuck not having Bilbo, who was a ring bearer, and the ring bearer, and wrote most of the story, so or half the story. That's the challenge. Um, really good choice, though. The, the catch would be, you would have to go, all right, I'm going to go full picture pip because then you can go to the, which I don't like, then you can go to the early 20th century, late 19th century fixed meaning associations and add more story to it. But those, like I have a Los Scarabeo Hobbit deck, which has that sort of art that I don't like, <laughs> but, and isn't quite as considered to the story. The, the Hobbit story is smaller in their defense, but isn't quite as thoughtfully placed as what was her name? Casey something. No, uh, Toma Hiyo is the illustrator. Casey Gilly is a mother of a toddler as well as a horror fan and a comics writer. So that's who created the deck. And I get that then. I get that's, that's someone who's a horror fan and comic writer. It has that level of, and she's in Portland. If anyone wants to, I don't know, say hi. <laughs> the illustrator is Spanish, Toma Hiyo. Uh, well, there you go. Good choice in Radagast though. Yeah, who's the hermit Bilbo? But he wasn't one. He ended up one, right? Um, he ended up one because he wanted to go to Rivendell to finish his book and, and finish off his life. So, and that's actually a movement into hermitage is generally what's in the cards. If you think about, so my Arthurian deck, which was the first deck I ever bought, uh, has Lancelot in exile as the hermit card, which is again, a good one because he, as a result of his 
crimes, his infidelities, he goes into exile in the woods uh, and, and is essentially like a naked hermit in the woods for a while. I quite like that. It's the going into hermitage, which Bilbo does. So I think it's a good choice. Uh, Radagast sort of just doesn't participate. Uh, and he's a good choice for Hermit. It's just that I think we'd, we'd lose Bilbo. The Radagast story is super interesting because we actually don't know. He doesn't go back into the West like Gandalf does. So he stays. There's, I don't know what happens. No one knows what happens to the Blue Wizards. But all the elves and everyone else goes. And Radagast doesn't. He stays in Mirkwood when all the other kind of magic leaves Middle Earth. It's a more fascinating arc of a character. But again, really good choice, Tessa, for uh, Hermit. It's just, we would then be asking, how can you do a Lord of the Rings deck without, uh, without Bilbo? And in fact, in the books, Radagast is really just a messenger. You know, he tells Gandalf, our oh, Saruman wants to see you, by the way. So that, in that, uh, interaction could be could have been a pip picture card cool this is a really good chat oh my god i at least am having a good time talking about this nonsense all right <laughs> casey jilly yeah uh, she's done really well with her choices i think so i thought it was good okay guys i'm go i have a couple of questions we're going to move into the q a now i have a few questions that were written in for a member q a and because this is public, I'm going to strip out the identifying information and just zero in on the questions. When I'm done with them, if you have them in the chat, remember I'm going to be reading off an iPad and uh, I won't be looking at the chat until in, in between. So I'll let you know when it's time to, to post them in the chat so we can get to them. <clears throat> but the first one is... On the last Q&A, you mentioned healing interventions on different levels, so body, heart and mind, mythic, and the field. I went through the energy course, and maybe I need to review it again to understand your statement more. That is the, the layout uh, around the medicine wheel of the shamanic healing system that I was trained in. Uh, and so it's, not, it's used as an example in the energy course rather than being contained in it. But then you go on to kind of get me to sanity check if you've understood this correctly. What accounts for heart and mind? Is it community giving, prayer, meditation, etc.? What accounts for intervening at the field? Is it plants, Reiki, protection curses, quantum slash past lives, energetic cleansing for the home and body? And what do you mean by mythic? Does dream work fall somewhere here? I ask because I have a lot of food tolerance, blood and gut related dreams. Interesting. Come to that in a second. So in this healing system that I'm trained in, the level of the body is, as you understand, it is the physical intervention. So it's toxin removal, supplementation, clean water, sunlight, good sleep, those kind of actual or, um, plant medicine, you know, ayahuasca and so on stuff. Molecules affecting molecules is one way of looking at it. The next level up is hearts and minds or uh, emotions and thoughts. And you've got here community giving prayer meditation. No, 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 it's literally stress, fear, anger, uh, but also good emotions. So uh, gratitude and love. Hang on a minute. Um, no, thanks, I'm on a call. Are you all good? Yeah. That was the housekeeping at 10.04 a.m. That's actually pretty early. So. Um, hearts and minds is thoughts and emotions and the impact consequently on health. How the, the medicine wheel that I was trained in works is that the level above impacts the layer below. So it's your, your thoughts and emotions that are um, powerfully impacting the physical body. We know this with things like anxiety and stress and so on. The next level up is the level of the story or the level of mythic. And when you ask what I mean by that or what I was trained in, that's the um, the potency of the reframe, the story you live in. And the fall of Numenor is a really good example. Here we are barreling towards World War II, the unnecessary collapse of Western civilization, unnecessary but inevitable, in the sense we don't need to be doing this, but we're going to. What frame do we encounter that in? And a big part when it comes to healing is the difference between let's say pain and suffering. 
pain is unavoidable. If you stub your toe, you experience pain. Suffering is refusing to let go of pain, or it is pain without meaning. So suffering, the release of suffering is entirely in your control. Uh, and, and shamanic healing is very good at bringing you to a place where you can release suffering. Because suffering is holding on to pain, which is unavoidable. It can help you to some extent with pain. But when you change the story, when you, and it's really powerful. This is what I mean by it's a mythic intervention. Changing the story will consequently, when you move down to the level of hearts and minds, change how you are emotionally experiencing something and also how you think about it. So that's it. Then the level above that is the field itself. Now you got a couple of them, right? That would be energy healing, like Reiki uh, and so on. But that's also essentially getting, receiving inspiration and guidance from divine intelligence, which flows into the mythic, which is, well, what story and frame do I step into? Which archetypal sequences have medicine for me to bring it down to hearts and minds, to bring it down to the physical? And that's what I do in a lot of my client sessions is we move around the medicine wheel and, uh, and, and work at each level that way. So that's what I meant by um, what I understood for mythic. Now, when you have uh, a lot of food tolerance, blood and gut related dreams, that's detox time. That would be spirit guidance of, okay, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to do some extended fasting, structured water. These are all examples, not medical advice, obviously. Uh, that's what you would want to be looking at. If you're literally dreaming about food tolerance and, and gut issues, that's a, uh, that's a good sign. You know, that's, that's, that's a sign that your imaginal is working correctly and is guiding you towards, and it, it's funny, it's obvious guidance because anyone who lives in the Western world could be given that guidance. Most of the time, I would say the slight majority of my sessions when we move into the part that's called tracking, where I get my spirits and their spirits to track around the client and work out what needs to be done. At the level of body, a slight majority of times, um, Sacha Mama, she comes through with sleep hygiene, bone broth, uh, water, detox. And that's because look at how we live. <laughs> the EMF, the rest of it. It's sort of there's no one who that advice wouldn't benefit to the extent that I almost, which I should never do, but I almost don't mention it when that comes through. Usually it's framed in the, this is the same for everyone to some extent. Usually it's a hit. Usually it's a, yes, I have in fact been staying up till 2 a.m. doom scrolling on my phone in my bed. Usually when she comes through saying sleep hygiene, someone's someone knows they could be doing better. <laughs> but those are the levels. Uh, that's what I meant by the different levels in different directions. It's not quite in the energy healing course because that's not what is taught in the energy, energy healing course. That's my system that I was used, that I was trained in, that I use as an example of a healing framework. There are all kinds of other ones because funnily enough, that, that medicine wheel in particular is an example of a story or an archetype that you can step into to arrange stuff underneath it. All right, the next one, uh, and this is from last year. We're talking about a Richard Dolan video, which we spoke about on the Ansible, called The Secret Effort to Investigate Aliens. And myself and a couple of other members had some really good and long detailed chats at the end of last year about um, this very long video, which this, uh, this questioner mentions, like, I didn't watch the whole thing. Yeah, it's quite long. <laughs> it's definitely quite long. But we were chatting on the Ansible about I don't want to say the shortcomings, but the uh, focus and priority of uh, Richard Dolan's research, uh, which is more in the ETH versus non-ETH world. For people who don't know, ETH is extraterrestrial hypothesis. Non-ETH is a framework of aliens that is not little green men. And this is accidentally <sighs> au courant, right? Because we are in some kind of faked alien invasion, blue beam, aborted narrative attempt right now, which plainly even Ed Snowden said has something to do with the fact that the US is trying to distract from the fact that everyone knows they blew up Nord Stream 2, which if you're watching this, you already knew the US blew up Nord Stream 2. But now they're trying to literally use a faked alien invasion or the hint of it to distract so they don't have to have 
answer awkward questions. The people who are coming off, because the rest of the world knows this is how the US behaves. The people who are coming off the worst here are the Europeans and especially the Germans who have silently sat there cocked as they knew the whole thing. This is what I mean. We end up in World War III. It's what happens. Uh, but <laughs> seeing as we're talking about ETH and non-ETH, uh, uh, we've got, does Mr. Dolan ever allow for any other ideas in the UFO space or is his true love the documenting to the nth detail of the actions of the US government 1945 to present around the UFO conspiracy space? So if you listen to his podcast on the show, on my show from 2019, I ask him, and he's actually a majority non-ETH guy. It's just he's also an historian of the Cold War. That's what he studied. And so his books are as an historian, but him as a human, he says the majority of encounters fit better into a non-ETH rather than an ETH view. So he's a blend. I still think a lot of the stuff in it a lot of his, listen to this one, not even that much. Some of his analysis tends towards ETH when it probably should be non ETH. But we almost, and the discussion we had in the Ansible was we need to separate that out. He's doing a job as an historian, which is I am looking at the documentation, FOIA requests, and so on to give you a paper trail of the involvement of the UFOs in the national security state. But as a ufologist, he's majority non ETH. So you carry on there that um, question two. So why are the folks in the USO, US UFO community so uncomfortable with the spirits and non-ETH neighbors when they're actively training to journey, lucid dream and remote view? And this is because um, this question notes that Richard's wife, Tracy, is an excellent and trained remote viewer. I'm not sure if um, maybe you're a new member because we spoke about that, but I was actually at Richard and Tracy's wedding in, uh, in Central Australia in 2018, 2019. They met each other, Tracy's amazing uh, and lovely, and they met each other, in, when I say recently, um, in the last 10 years or so, so long after Richard had already had his career as a ufologist. So it's not that he's uncomfortable with it, it's that Tracy brings her own background and experience as a remote viewer into that partnership. So it's not after, um, it's not that they're squeamish about it or anything. It's that a lot of Richard's publishing work predates him meeting Tracy. And both of them, you know, are now key contributors to his media empire, his, his output. So it's, that's the sequence of events rather than him ignoring it for so long. It's, it's, it's not that at all. It's his job as a historian is the documentation. He's a majority non-ETH guy philosophically. Uh, and his wife, Tracy, is a excellent remote viewer and interested, and as you say, trained at the Robert Monroe Institute and all the rest of it. So final question, finally, after doing the RSPM journeying course this past year and the UFOs and fairies course last year, as well as reading Robert Monroe's first book and listening to a number of podcasts on the subject uh, where many conflate the two, how would you, Gordon White, which is me, define the difference between journeying and lucid dreaming in your own practice? That's a really good question. I would say it's the difference between running and walking in the same realm. So it's a different mode of experiencing the same place, which is to say the imaginal. So you can do things, in the, why this is a really good question is for people who don't know, the best definition of lucid dreaming is being awake while dreaming and intentionally operating in the dream space which is not that far from what you do when you journey, right? So that's why that's a really good question. And the way I frame that is it's the different, not that one is faster or slower, although it sort of is. Journeying would be running and, and lucid dreaming would be walking, but it's different modes of experiencing the same place would be how I would define it. All right, final question. and. Um, actually, I'm not sure. I think I've seen you in the chat. I'm not sure if you are. Um, new course is great. The offering tech is super helpful. Will you wait till this week? Especially like having the goody baddie split on the altar. That we did an explanation of my main altar in the spirit room, left left hand, right hand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
A quick question. One of the reasons why I struggle to maintain a regular practice is because I overthink things and overcomplicate things, which means the daily ritual takes too long and sometimes life gets in the way and then I stop for longer than I wish to admit. <laughs> but would finding your breath, locating a feeling of joy and gratitude, pouring some water with the intention of offering it, all wrapped up in under a minute, constitute a bare minimum for a daily offering? So don't let perfect be the enemy of good. I have a life where I can get up before sunrise and do. That's part of you know having animals and, and so on. And I have a life arranged that allows, I mean, not right now, although I did get up this morning um, for a uh, before the sun for a Venus rite, which if you are doing the foundations course, you will see soon. I have a life that allows me to get up and do and, and have an offering, a daily offering practice that fits with how I live. Really, rather than bare minimum or maximum, this is like anything else, if it's weight loss or fitness training or what have you, it's not about commitments and resolutions, it's about habits. Uh, it's about changing habits. So if there's a thing you can do that you will do every day, uh, that is better, that's good rather than perfect. And an example, so speaking of clients, one of the uh, daily practices that I've been helping a client with involves cold showers, which I think everyone should take. Uh, but a cold shower is initially is a breathwork exercise, but because you have to remember to do the cold shower and hit the timer for two minutes. Uh, I do mine at the end. I have a cold tank, but when I was doing cold showers, it was at the end. So that you finish off cold. That followed by some of those heart locking or breathing techniques sort of immediately after as part of that sequence is a daily practice. Now, when you talk about is, you know, doing that in under a minute and offering water, is that enough? You don't even need to offer water. You can offer gratitude and thanks. You can do that directionally. So you can do the heart lock in, connect to earth, connect to sky, whatever you want, and just um, send gratitude and thanks to the four directions. That's under a minute. That is 100% better than doing nothing. <laughs> but it's a habit rather than a resolution. And that's the, the key. This comes back to the reframing or stepping into a story that works. Very often we get caught up in failing at a resolution because all resolutions fail, uh, failing at a resolution and thinking, oh, you know, now I've fallen off a wagon or what have you. Just intervene at the level of habit. Just be like, no, I'm stepping into a habit, which is I'm going to cold shower and then afterwards, uh, uh, you know, around uh, seven rounds of box breathing or four rounds of box breathing and directional gratitude you can do that stepping out of the shower. Uh, and if you do that every day, if you shower in the morning and you do a cold shower, then you've got something. You can add a praise to the, the governing planet of that day if you want. The whole thing is wrapped up two minutes in the cold shower, getting straight out, dry yourself, uh, and it can be done then. The whole thing's wrapped up in under a minute. So yes, the, the key is don't let... Uh, perfect be the enemy of good and and also realize it's a intervention at the level of habit rather than resolution rather than like I am going to commit I resolve yeah I you know I'm going to go to the gym every week three times a week and I'm not going to drink wine except on the weekend all that all those things fail because that's not how humans work <laughs> we work along the level of habits so find it there and you'll find that once you've got that it can build to other stuff. But yes, 100% better to have something rather than nothing on a daily basis for sure. That was the uh, final of the uh, questions that I compiled for the write-in. So for the kids in the chat, yeah, Wim Hof for the win, got that right. Wim Hof is a good example of a habit change that can become magical. Because one of the reasons I think that works is 
obviously when you're breathing, we've got the observed chemical effects of deoxygenating and reoxygenating the blood and it creating more red blood cells, which include, which improves overall uh, oxygen carrying capacity in the body. And those are the powerful long-term effects that you get physically from Wim Hof breathing. But as we know, breath is the most, how to say this right, the easiest and most potent interface between the human organism and the spirit world is via the breath. Spirit and breath come from the same Latin root, um, air, spirits of the air, and so on. So this is the interface in your lungs where the spirit world gets into the rest of you. And it's why you have you know, yogic breathing, and we have had for 10,000 years. We are operating with energies and spirit there, which means when you're doing Wim Hof breathing, we can measure the chemical effects in the blood, but you are also moving energy. And, and more importantly, you're kind of bringing energy up to the glands in the head. So the pineal, which is to say third eye or crown for some people actually, you are bringing energy up in that final breath in at the end of the breathing in and out and, and, and holding on empty, that final breath in, you're pulling energy up, essentially your column of chakras uh, up into this head area. And so this is a really good example of at the end of three rounds of Wim Hof breathing, you'll know that you feel really charged up. That's another opportunity to do a 30 second. If you do your Wim Hof breathing as part of a morning sequence, it's another opportunity to do your, let's say daily alignment, if not devotional, but offering gratitude and thanks to the four directions and gratitude and thanks to the sort of presiding spirit of the day. But yes, Wim Hof for the fucking win. Um, yeah, I knew you were in the chat. Uh, knew you were in the chat, Rob. I wanted to anonymize it for posterity. And your new job sounds interesting. We will mention that in the actual members chat because uh, I think you're going to have some. I think you're going to have some fun with that. Uh, I remember you saying Edith would be your Invisibles character. So who's your Lord of the Rings character? Ooh. So many to choose from. <laughs> I mean, everyone says Gandalf, right? Gandalf the Grey would be a really good one. I do live a kind of Radagast life, though. Uh, but I also used to live a Gandalf life. Still kind of do. I don't know. There's, there's, there's an appeal to so many of them. Being an Ent would be amazing. Uh, you miss out on some sex, though, <laughs> I guess. It's, it would be Gandalf or Radagast, for sure, when you think about it. Who wouldn't want to be a wizard? Look what we do. Yeah. I've been doing Wim Hof for about six years. It changed my life. Same, not for six years, though. I've been doing it for a bit over, what year is this? 18 months to two years. Um, but yes, I probably should ask really serious questions about the world right now. Nah, Lord of the Rings stuff. That's where we've been going. Will any directional ritual to honor will any directional ritual work to honor the directions? For example, I've been combining the seven angels prayer and the heptameron daily angel prayers. Absolutely. That is a powerful combination. I love one of the reasons I love the heptameron prayers is that it's directional magic. So there are different angels that you call in in different directions depending on the governance of the day. That's huge, which is why there's that simplified uh, directional angel material in the members area based on it. That's really powerful. You can just say, well, I, what I say in, in my healing tradition, because it's called the four winds, right? But I say spirits and winds of the south, spirits and winds of the west. But if I'm doing angelic magic, the or even basically non-shamanic healing ceremonies, it's a truncated seven angel prayer and angelic directions for sure. Because not just that, one of the other reasons we did the 72, is, uh, and the Gnostic angels and all the rest of it, you can kind of enfold. <laughs> you have a really powerful angelic uh, directional tech that you can kind of build. And we'll revisit that idea as we move through the foundations, but any directional ritual work to honor the directions is, uh, is essential right relational magic. Uh, if, if, I, if I can get anything other than sigils, changed. It's 
elevating the preeminence of the directions over the things that are actually called directionally so that we can stop arguing about uh, elemental associations and so on, which again, we will be talking about in the foundations in a subsequent section. Um, I had a quick question for my mom, who's a permaculturalist, so I felt personally targeted in the future, arche future archaeology course because I do have one lying around. So she's magic adjacent, but always has trouble wrapping her head around it. Any simpler text I can recommend? She loves Ingold, funnily enough, but doesn't quite get it. Uh, for people who are right there, if when you say simpler texts, I'm, I would recommend animistic, but if, that's, if summoning dragons is a bit too much for her, books like Dean Radin's Real Magic and anything that's in that parapsychology world, but Real Magic is good, or Lynn McTaggart's work, because it looks at the impact of intention on the growth of plants specifically, and the subsequent nutritional quality in those plants. And it's, you know, old timey materialist science in its own way. That tends to push the door a little bit more open. So if you've got open minded permi people who aren't necessarily ready for dragon summoning, that's where I would start. You start with the, dare I say, psi and parapsychological research into the physical. So Lynn's work, because she like the, she's done plenty of research on the impact of intending for on the, the speed of growth for mung beans and all kinds of stuff. But real magic, I think, is a good place to to start. It's very readable as well. Just wanted to also let you know we have been doing lots of magical experiments with Buddhist gratitude tech in the membership. Yes, specifically merit dedication. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Would love to hear your thoughts on it at some point. There's some, by the time we've finished allies, there'll be some information. Ask that question again by the time we've finished allies. Um, have you trained in the rights of the Munai Ki? I got the Munai Ki rights as part of the um, shamanic healing training. Because yes, that's Alberto's uh, some inherited and some created rights. So to answer your question, yes. Uh, any further thoughts regarding the recent show with Peter Mark Adams? I'm very interested in his thesis about the continuity of the mysteries, as well as reorienting the neoplats as practical. So I, yes, here is the answer. The thing I want to see, what I liked about the latest book is it is an example of other things that have survived. What we know has survived, if you look at what was Dr. Stephen Skinner's PhD, but it is, is now the, the two books, uh, Techniques, uh, The Greek Magical Papyri and The Grimoire's Book. I forget exactly what they're called. You can talk about it in the chat. Uh, so we have the story of how Hellenistic, a, a Hellenistic cosmovision that includes magic made it into the grimoires that we would recognize from the Greek magical papyri, although that is not a direct connection. And I'm very interested in where else that stuff survives. Some of it, so technical hermetica survives into European herb law almost unchanged. Uh, if you actually look at the herbal associations in Europe and look at ancient Egyptian herbals, they're the same. <laughs> so a lot of the traditional European associations ultimately derive from essentially Egyptian magic, which isn't surprising. Um, they were filtered through Greece and Rome and out into the world. Uh, so what else survives? I'm, I am interested particularly in, so what works in Peter's hypothesis or in a scientific sense that Hagia Sophia was constructed based on these principles that survived from the classical world. Because we know that you have the golden ratio and, and other human resonant ratios in classical and ancient Greek architecture like the Parthenon and so on. So that idea of uh, creating something that has harmonic effects, I am fairly satisfied he's correct in his contention that Hagia Sophia is, a, is an example of that, and that it was someone, whether it was the builders themselves 
whether it was the emperor, did that as a kind of spell. Because we did see, you know, a couple of centuries later, not even that much later in the West, the transformation of the Gothic form of cathedral building into the, the great cathedral project that we know today that's also filled with uh, harmonic tech. So Chartres and, and all the rest of these big, glorious um, cathedrals. And that was a, a building project that doesn't make historical sense unless there was a plan to be using these things almost on a universal or a macro basis to change the energetics of Europe, because it was a bigger stone moving project than the entirety of dynastic Egypt. So the, uh, those kind of Gothic cathedrals is these uh, field generators built in stone is another a little bit later example of like, well, what's going on here? What are they doing? And then later again, we have the explicit arrival of hermetic understanding into Renaissance architecture and Renaissance art. So I'm interested in how they survive. I hadn't, so the Hagia Sophia one is earlier, which I think is, which tracks because more stuff survived on the East in Byzantium, which is why the grimoires had to come back in from the East into Italy and then back up. So that I found as they don't connect. So it's not like the, the, the school of Athens left with some scrolls that became grimoires and, and went to Constantinople. It wasn't that exactly, but it does mean that there is that, that flow from the Hellenistic world into Byzantium in a direct sense. Now, as for the mysteries, I haven't looked into, I'm sure he's right, but I haven't actually looked into the, family ownership of the mysteries and the school of Athens and so on. I think more than just the Eleusinian mysteries, if indeed that was it at all, um, came through into the architecture. And when I say at all, there are other forms outside of Eleusis. If Peter's right that Hagia Sophia has those three levels, that there's an afterlife, the, the grass things going on here, and this is the ocean underneath the world, and then there's a kind of middle realm. That's not just in the Eleusinian Mysteries. That's the Eleusinian Mysteries are an example of it happening. So that's what I think about it. Uh, it was a fun book. It, it's uh, it's definitely definitely a it's definitely a Peter Mark Adams book. Put it that way. Um, and second question: What are you reading at the moment, and what is on your future list? The escapism is good at the moment. So I'm going to read. If you're talking about Middle Earth stuff, I'm going to read the Nature of Middle Earth, which came out before. Fall of Numenor, and I just haven't got around to it. So I'm going to read that next. I think that came out in 2021. And other than that, I am reading stuff, reading research stuff for uh, shamanic healing and for the final book. But escapism-wise, that's that's what I'm reading. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. I should have brought that one with me because... I didn't expect to have so many nights on my own <laughs> at a loss for things to read. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> cool. Any further thoughts? All right. Any other questions in the old chatterty chat? Because if not, uh, there's some kind of weird construction. This has been... Again, what I was saying at the beginning about you notice the sound more. Yesterday, because I was trying to film here, they were um, using high pressure hoses to clean the side of the buildings all day. <laughs> and then there was the screaming children. And now it sounds like, I don't know, an earth mover. It's crazy. Thoughts on the Pirates book from David Graeber. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I have been listening to that on my drive through the cyclone, uh, the audio book. I will say don't get the audiobook. I don't want to say it's badly narrated, but there is some, I don't think the guy is that interested in the material. So I keep wandering. I keep wandering completely away from it. I think about this book the same way I think about all of David Graeber's books, which was he was so close to magic. Like I like his stuff, except insufficiently haunted. I mean, I love his stuff. That's like on Kings. Dawn of Everything is like a starships that avoids magic. 
uh, and actually that's what Peter Gray said as well. It's like David Graeber wrote Starships, but took all the magic out. And yeah, and I'm not saying it's a plagiarism for God's sake, but he and I, well, he was very inspired by anarchism and so am I, so it's not surprising. This story of Madagascar and a pirate enlightenment is fascinating and again the magic is right there so the, the general idea for people who are unaware uh, what's it called pirate enlightenment um, something like that is that there was a non-european or at least non-white enlightenment before the enlightenment which is important to understand because we're at a point to some extent rightly so where a lot of the enlightenment positions are being uh, ejected because many of them were used as justification for European empires. That's what I mean by to some extent rightly so. But David Graeber wrote this book. Actually, what he says at the beginning was it started off as an essay in another book. He's, and he said, and I love this, people hate long essays, but they love short books. So he turned it into a short book because that's true. And it's the story of Madagascar and the pirates who, in mingling with the locals, had this version of enlightenment. Many people would be aware that pirates had essentially an anarch approach to governance. For the, 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 the golden age of piracy really only lasted about 85 years. But during that time, there are examples of places where women can vote, captains are elected. There was a form of like anarch group sharing of things like treasure and so on. So that's where I thought he was going with it. And to some extent it is. But holy shit, Madagascar, I was completely unaware, was a roiling magical kingdom before these pirates showed up. There were Arab descendants who were the ceremonialists of the island who ran the ceremonies of the island, cattle sacrifices and all the rest of it, according to essentially the lunar calendar the mansion system that you'd find in the Picatrix. There was an island of self-identified Jews who may or may not have been Gnostics, but they, uh, and in, before the pirates got there, you have these blends of magic mingling with an indigenous magic uh, already that's there and indigenous customs, which meant that the sexual mores were more like we would understand them so that both men and women um, before marriage were expected to have dalliances and different tribes didn't even really care. This is the same in New Guinea and other places. Fidelity wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, and, and it was actually only once sort of more Arabic influence came in that they tried to uh, sort of suppress female sexuality and the incoming kind of pirate component to all this stuff made this incredible blend. But all the way through listening to this book, which is its own kind of fascinating, definitely read it rather than buy it. Because, and I love ebooks. I mean, I love audiobooks, but this one was a struggle. The whole way through, all I'm thinking is there needs to be more magic. Something I learned about pirates that I didn't know before, which is relevant to what I just said, is the Jolly Roger derives from the pirate understanding that what they are doing is condemning them to hell anyway. So that's why it was so scary. They're like, we already know we're going to hell. You hoist the Jolly Roger and it tells other people like, we're gonna kill you uh, if, if you don't give us your stuff because we're going to hell anyway. So there's no morality that is going to stop us when it comes to pirating. So they're essentially, and some of them were actively devil worshippers in that there was a conflict resolution system that involved pouring out all the um, the rum if there was a conflict situation to the devil himself and then to so that he would take the the devil would take the argument back to hell and then they could resolve conflict between them so there was sort of accidental devil worship going on and, and and almost in a goth metaphoric way like well we're, we're damned anyway so let's do this, which is super interesting when it comes to the development of a pirate anarchism, which included sexual liberation and not just for women, but 
the pirate project was gay as a tree full of parrots. It was, there's a great book called Sodomy and the Pirate Tradition, which essentially explains how um, if you were what we would call today gay, it would be, you'd just join a pirate ship because they're all fucking each other. And that plus operate, so that's an example of the things that you have philosophical room to engage in if you know you're going to hell. And I find that the, the, the liberation devil Lucifer stuff archetypally in there, I find really compelling that's contained in the Jolly Roger given. So essentially the freedom that comes from knowing you're going to hell means you get to do all this or allows you to do all this other stuff, which today we think of as quite good, you know, women getting the right to vote and owning property and other such terrifying ideas. They got there because they thought they were going to hell. And, and it was that, that powerful Promethean liberating archetype that, that opened that space up. That hitting an island of lunar mansion, cattle sacrificing, half, well, not half Jewish, Jewish, Arab, refugee, African mix, collection of kingdoms. Holy shit. <laughs> what, uh, what an amazing, what an amazing story. Oh, and also the, the intermingling of pirates with some of the upper class, which included the ceremonialists, made that very often some of the they would become magicians or that the, uh, the Arab traders who would stay along the sort of northeast coast of Madagascar and settle there would basically become astrologers and magicians. So you have this fucking crazy pirate king island of lunar mansions and magic and, and, and proto-anarchism and a kind of enlightenment. So yeah, as is usual with David Graeber's stuff, it's brilliant if you read it with magical eyes, for sure. Uh, just don't get the audiobook. I know a bunch of you are going to get the audiobook now going like, oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. And, uh, and you will have wasted your credit because I'm right. <laughs> I'm right about this. Um, do I consider my books egregores, like consulting spirits in your practice? I consider them... Oh, this is going to sound really dumb. Just go with me to the end of this. I consider them what I assume people consider children to be which is I make them, but once they exist, I'm kind of aware that I didn't really make them. <laughs> so they have their own, but they are made intentionally to do things, particularly the Dot trilogy, Starships, Animistic, and I'm not going to tell you yet, uh, the third one that I'm working on here, individually are designed to do things and combined are designed to do things. Um, and and that's that emerged. So I don't, I wouldn't, I, I know what you mean by egregore, they certainly, there is certainly a field that is starships and a field that is animistic. And I, I would say magical items, like a ring of power, that an elven ring rather than the ring of power, rather than the one ring, they have a field effect. And now they're out in the world doing their thing is how I think of, I want to say all books, but it's, I can think of a couple of examples, you know, um, AI, ghost written, Kindle ebooks, probably not. But magical books, yes, that's how I think of my books. Thank you for asking. What a great question. Please write that book, the pirate book with the magic. I know. I have enough fucking books. <laughs> I have enough fucking books to write. That would be a good one. Yes, the pirate. Like, honestly, driving around, I'm like, should I? This happens to, I have this real, you know, the episode of The Simpsons where. Um, Homer is a spy or breaking in somewhere and they see a milkman drive by and they're hiding from him. He says, maybe I should be a milkman. He starts standing up and he gets pulled back down. That's what I think whenever I hear of another place. It's like, should I move to Madagascar? I'm not going to. But I, I was so shocked at the discovery of this Arab, Jewish, African pirate magic island <laughs> what the hell should i yeah um but that is funny enough when you have these ideas this is why my mind kept wandering listening to the audiobook in the car was 
well, how would I write this book? And I'm like, well, I need to move to Madagascar, obviously, that's step one. Uh, and, and so my mind kind of wandered in that direction. But I would, yes, writing a pirate magic book. Yeah, uh, and apparently from my off, I had been a pirate. Sorry, I'm late here. No, it's all good. It's all about the booty. That would, they'd probably be, given sodomy in the pirate tradition, there would be some kind of butt sex wordplay in the title, something about pirate booty, for sure. Um, is it your take that spiritism slash Umbanda Sanse is the future framework or meta model is the new foundational structure of future magic slash a culture as opposed to the past um, Levy, Golden Dawn, Crowley, aka Car Crash framework? I haven't heard it called Car Crash before. Short answer, yes. Long answer is I wouldn't say it is new or future. Spiritism is a rediscovery. Um, call it an archaic revival to use a mechanism term. In So spiritism and spiritualism, 19th century spirit contact models have to emerge. And remember, that's only about 100 years, even less. It's about 90 years after the, the sort of orthodoxy was maybe even less than that, 50 years after the orthodoxy was. There's no such thing as any of this shit. It's all just fucking gears. God made, God set this clock running and that's it. Uh, or even then it's like, it's just, there's nothing but material. And it's sort of like trying to keep weeds out of a garden. In a permaculture context, there's no such thing as weeds. You have recovery species. And recovery species are what grows first to prepare the soil for the next in a phase of um, species and growth that if you're in a temperate area, ultimately several centuries later finishes in an old growth forest. But it begins with blasted land that these recovery plants, which we call weeds, grow into to improve the soil and die and, and begin that cycle. Things like spiritism and spiritualism are weeds for a soil that has been monsantoed by empire and atheism, which is the same thing in a European context anyway. So uh, that's what your question is great. Do I think a spiritism model is what's next? Yes, if you understand that spiritism is a recovery species for that. The, if you've in the premium members area, actually, is it publicly available? I can't remember. The, no, it's not. In the premium members area, the boots in the wall presentation about cunning traditions. I think certainly it's the Rune Soup project uh, is a archaic revival of cunning traditions. When we talk about what is the thing we want to have flourish from the Northwest European tradition, it's that. Now, a cunning tradition is the Northwest European thing that looks most like spiritism in a, uh, or a spiritismo in a Brazilian et cetera context, because it is a practitioner specific collection of spirits and talents that doesn't belong to a bigger cosmology except that, except that the cosmology is magic works and people are kind of good at fortune telling or energy healing uh, and they have their own sort of spirits or saints, which are these beings that exist uh, in a cosmos. So great question. Yes, I think that is the thing that is emerging after the the final. Uh, and it's good, I guess, that it's collapsing into idiocy and self-parody, The particularly the Thelemic stuff, but like the Golden Dawn Thelemic 19th century gentleman's, middling Freemason's gentleman's hobby. Um, that's, it's having its last little out of copyright death rattle now, but the actual thing that's coming through, not just in, you know, the English speaking world, but the non-English speaking or the non-Anglosphere is more of that cunning curanderismo, espiritismo blend. Great question, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, also Latin American spiritism is Jewish, Arab and pirate magic within it. So a sign. Exactly. <laughs> So does hoodoo. Hoodoo's got, you know, the, the Jewish pharmacies and and Karib and, and all kinds of cool shit going on in there, right? Uh, anything, this is, 
I've been saying this since forever. The stuff that looks like the biosphere is the healthiest. Mm -hmm. So diversity, right? Biodiversity of magic is the healthiest. And, and it is those blends. It's why you, we have this challenge, although it's sort of gone away now. I understand cultural appropriation is, is as I've said before, a white girl wearing a feathered headdress to the Sonar Festival. It's not, uh, it's not how spirits and magic works. There's, there's that blend there. Like hoodoo is this beautiful mix of, you know, indigenous herb lore and um, Jewish pharmacy and, and blue grimoires and, and Catholic prayers and Baptist use of psalms and so on. It's a blend. That's, that's, how we, uh, that's how we look at it. Any book recommendations for Mayan magic? Just started reading Jaguar Wisdom by Kenneth Johnson, which is a good book. Uh, not really, except there's that big giant Maya Cosmos book, which came out in the early 90s, which frames the classical era and post-classical Mayan building project in a cosmology that the writers encountered still as a extant living tradition. That's a mandatory book to read, put it that way. I would also say, I like Kenneth Johnson's books, I've got them all. Um, and stay tuned for next week's podcast guest is, uh, is all I'll say on that one. But that's my Mayan book recommendation for sure. Also, how in God's name do we save solar punk from this ridiculous twisted empire version of it that's going around? We don't, <clears throat> I don't think we save anything. I don't think anything gets saved, I think. And funnily enough, there is a question that came through from a member, which is related to this. How do we save um, witchcraft? from the discourse, like when we look at what online witchcraft is. And it's sort of that fall of Numenor stuff, that complicity with that Kingsmen version of witchcraft. And the answer is we don't. It's just what happens now. And same thing with solar punk. Fortunately, solar punk, like uh, permaculture, contains within it this chop and drop recovery species idea, which is the stuff that grows. And I know what you mean. It's what began as an optimism to stretch for eventually gets infected with um, climate alarmism, Club of Rome stuff. So we don't save it. We just, if you, what's good about solar punk is that it's a fiction project, whatever that means, is you just write better solar punk or create better solar punk. But I don't think anything gets saved. Not in the way, saving requires intervening at the level of the physical with the assumption that you know better than the cosmos. Well, this is a challenge that Bayo Komalafe looks at, that Charles Eisenstein looks at, which is where do we intervene? Like we have this, if we don't like something, so I'm certainly online witchcraft discourse <laughs> since 2016 is a very good example of that. Uh, so is some solar punk. If we don't like it, the funny thing is, Intervening to fix it is exactly the ideology that we don't want, which is this sort of correcting or perfecting the world, or I think I know better. That's not where we intervene. We have to just do and be better. We have to do and be a more authentic or situated version of whatever it is. We're talking about solar punk and, uh, and witchcraft. It could be gymnastics, if gymnastics has a king's men problem, which I presume it does. I don't know. Uh, that I'm, I'm really struck by. And that's there in, in Animistic, and that's certainly there in, in a lot of the long um, discussions and explorations we have in the members area. But the, whenever I get a how-to question, I come back to that Charles Eisenstein idea. It's not what can I do, it's where can I do something. In the case of solar punk, it's like, well, I'm just gonna do some better solar punk, but, you know? Um, yeah. And how do we magically incorporate it? How do you magically incorporate solar punk? I'm not there yet. I think, I think we magically incorporate and live solar punk next decade. I'm just trying to get through 
the sinking of Numenor first. We have to get through a world war and the, <laughs> the great American divorce and all kinds of stuff before we get to live in the solar punk world. So I'm not there yet as to answer it. Maybe that helps. Maybe it's sort of allow the good solar punk material to keep you warm <laughs> for the next nine years, right? I'm not, I don't magically incorporate solar punk yet. Uh, it is, how to say this right? That doesn't mean we hold off, let's say, an animus right relation approach to magic. I'm doing that now. Solarpunk is different though. Solarpunk is um, the the optimism of of almost like post industrial beginnings, and we're just not quite there yet. There's there's a, there's engagement with this moment or these series of moments to be done. You can, although I don't I don't direct medicine from Solarpunk directly for this. Part of building the next decade. We've got a geodesic dome green, greenhouse where we're growing things, um, planting habitat for fairy wrens. There's stuff we can do that's, that belongs in a solar punk world, but it's also making those interventions at the level of the field now just because that's what humans are supposed to do. And you might not have land that you can put to fairy wren habitat, but there will be an intervention at the level of the field for, for your life. Maybe that's enough for for solar punk. Creating solar punk is how you magically incorporate it now, if you want, for sure. Yeah. Gentleman's hobby, it's just a funny phrase. It is, isn't it? It's like a like a room at the back of a barber shop where they masturbate to like old timey black and white pornography or something. I don't know. Cunning traditions with chaos magic as its as its source code. So I think chaos magic was one of the first eruptions of the return of the cunning tradition, which I've discussed uh, on in the Grimoire course, I believe. All right. If chaos magic equals cunning traditions to spiritismo, then sure. I think I think it's what the plant species looked like when it grew in the mid eighties in England. Like I think it's what the recovery species looked like then. So it's not that. That's that's really key. <laughs> Because it too, and I say this at the end of piece of eight, the founders are still alive. This is a uh, a school of magic or philosophy that is still in that first phase. Uh, and it's an open guess as to how long after, because most philosophies don't survive very long after. Their, the majority of them end within a century of their founders dying. But Ray and Pete are still alive. <laughs> so we'll find out. I think it's safe to say that chaos magic is what a, a cunning recovery species looks like growing in the soil of, let's say, Thatcher's Britain. Now, I much prefer working with a group of spirits than picking one and only one to be the designated go between me and the spirit world. That, sure. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you'll get grimoire systems where you just get the one as the intermediary, but you will also find, at least from the witch trials, that English witch trials and Scottish ones, that it's fairly common for a witch or cunning person to have that, that single intermediary. But even then, you would have that person praying to saints and God and Mary and whatever. So depending on how you define these things, you'd have more than one more route. How irredeemable is the Rings of Power for you? Can you explain a bit more on how the Rings of Power's Galadriel is a Saronic subversion? I did a show with Miguel. So look up the last time I was on Aeon Byte, um, end of last year, where I talk more about it, uh, talk about all of it there. It's completely irredeemable, but it's also not, I have no energy. The thought of Rings of Power no longer has any energy for me because I got to the end of episode two or the beginning of episode three and realized this isn't Lord of the Rings. This isn't Middle Earth. This isn't even Xena. <laughs> uh, and so I don't need to. I don't need to have any thought or impressions about it. It is simply not Tolkien. In the same way, you could dress a couple of dogs in pointy wizard hats and sequins, 
and say, oh, this is the story of the second age. It isn't. That would be better. I would certainly watch that. But you can't just say something is Tolkien and then make it all up. <laughs> so that was the way out. I'm like, oh, gosh, I don't even need to watch this because you can say it's Tolkien, but it isn't. And it has, it has no bearing on it, which is fascinating. It's Again, it's got a Gnostic component there. It's a pseudo-reality. Um, all right. If it's real, it can take the pressure. There he is, Terence McKenna. I like this. Nothing gets saved. This push to saving reads to me as a sort of nomenclature and categorical push. Remove the category and be and create at the level of the field. Yeah, exactly. So Bayo Kamalafe says, what if the way we respond to the crisis is part of the crisis? Empire around the world is slash was a moral intervention. The British told themselves as they were moving up from Southern Africa and through that the moral justification for this was in no large part because of what used to be called female circumcision, but is correctly better called female genital mutilation, which happens. And so it's not like, ah, oh, let them do whatever they want. No, <laughs> didn't say that. But claiming entire countries and using that and, and saying you have the moral high ground intervening there. Same thing with sati or widow burning in India when it switched from essentially a private or corporate project to a British imperial one it was the same idea, moral justification. What if the way we respond to the crisis is part of the crisis? This need to fix things implies a broken that excludes the possibility of agencies other than the human. And it doesn't mean you sit back and do nothing. It means we need to first sit with, what if the way we respond to the crisis is part of the crisis? We see this with politics, with something must be done, doneism, uh, etc. So yeah, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, to use Charles's term, is one in which it is a field first intervention. It's, it's understanding that what we do works there first and best. And again, it doesn't mean non-intervention. It's that. It, it is having a new philosophy of intervening. Um, yeah. <clears throat> good, good, good. It's your first course, very good and clever. This isn't even Xena, that's Ace. Well, I, I think about that because the, the togas were worse than Xena's togas. Uh, anyway, how do you... Was it a CIA money laundering scheme to have spent a billion dollars on rings of power and, and come out with what they came out with? You, you could have made it for $250,000 by the looks of it. Anyway. Um... Have you begun to see a mass coalescing of your various spirits and courts, such as your shamanic lineage spirits and angels, like a self-asserting mandala that I'm Gordon White's magic, something new? Short answer, yes. I wouldn't use those terms to describe it. But the, so Alberto's training, he's in his 70s now, late 70s, I actually think. And so he's been doing this for a bajillion years. And before he got the Caro lineage rights, he spent actually spent more of his time with sorcerers and curanderas learning from them in Peru. So he calls it shamanism because that's what you call it in the 90s when you are published by Hay House. But it is curanderismo. Uh, and I actually think if he was doing it today, he might even have the wherewithal to call it that. But you just, you, that word... For, for, for a English-speaking or white audience in the 90s wasn't going to work. Curanderismo as a effectively cunning tradition, you could, and we can, you could write a master's thesis on the difference between them, is a framework of practitioner-specific spirits as a team working in a cosmos where magic is real. So one of the things that I vibed with, with the incorporation of lineage spirits that I got <clears throat> through those initiations was, yeah, they work. Um, they, and in fact, when we got the, the, the main kind of 
tutelary and, and healing beings installed in us, he described them as, you can call these archangels if you want. These are luminous companions. And in my healing stuff with clients now, it's those beings, it's different saints and angels that I had pre-existing relationships with. And that's how it's supposed to work. That's how it works for everyone who does the work rather than talks about it. And that, I promise you, this is my foundation's promise, you're not going to get exactly that because you're not me. <laughs> but you are going to get, I will get you there if you do the work. I will get you into that because that is literally what magic is. That is it around the world. It is not the 19th century crap. Um, that's what it is. And, and I will get you there. Yeah. All right. Good. Are we ever going to get a Gordon White podcaster elevation tour? <laughs> uh, we are not heading into good. That would be lovely. We're not heading into a, uh, a world that makes travel desirable. Well, it's always desirable to me. Yes, I would love that. Maybe a reunion tour or something in, in you know, my 50s. Again, the, realistically, this decade has, is, you know, it has begun as it means to continue, which is to say it's going to be the worst decade of your life, which is the good and the bad news, right? This is, you're in it. So survive it and, and the rest of however long you're on earth will be better than this. Uh, but that's how it is. I would love, <laughs> I would love to do a podcast too. Before March of 2020, that was when I was about to start a travel business, which would mean that I could take people to the jungle every year and every second year do a, a tour of Hermetic Italy and otherwise Egypt and also go to Nan Madol. So it'd be probably Nan Madol and Peru every year and alternate Egypt and Italy. Uh, and that was going to be, yeah, so there would have been a lot more of the, the traveling around. That world doesn't ever happen. But yeah, an elevation to <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> oh, that's a Zoom tour. No, 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 no. No, come on now. Yeah. No. God, no. If I'm going to do that, I'm going to do it right. But yeah. All right. These are good questions. This was fun. This is, uh, we haven't done this one as a, as a public live stream before. Uh, and, and I like having the blend. It's still mostly member questions, but I like having the blend uh, of you guys. Uh, but if there isn't anything else, we've done pretty good. We've done over um, two hours. I'm just going to give it a second or two, as I usually do, because there's usually someone, there might be someone frantically typing, no, stay, no, I'm not done with my lengthy question. All right, no, we're starting to get the thanks, I think. I think we're ready to roll. I think we are out of here. All right. Damn it, if you're waiting for someone to smack up Russell Brand and Jordan Peterson with that final push. I, I still, I know he's a carnival barker in his own way, but I like Russell Brand. Yeah. I like him well enough. There aren't enough of us. I like Jimmy Dore more, but I view them as people like that. Yeah. All righty, guys. Well, we're in the thanks and uh, and thankings to you as well for sticking around and asking cool questions and generally providing the entertaining text-based commentary to my meanderings. All right. Awesome, guys. Well, again, thank you very much. And I shall see you in the next one. As you can tell, we're still playing with the format of the live stream. But I am committing to doing them every second week. And I do like the idea of having the Q&As as an impromptu part at the end. I think we're going to keep doing that. I think that works. Uh, and yeah, but next week is a guest and, and it's a good one. So I shall, I shall see you there and then.